just a while the bell ta to 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 la ta to to ta ta to 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 reiki tink 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 and once again the purple dragon strikes its evil blood dripping claws to 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 who's the purple dragon well you come to the right place la ta to Tonight's program may have a considerable irritant quality that uh, is not necessarily uh, intended by the manufacturer. It does not represent the views of the owners of this station, or the person performing, or anybody else. In fact, it's the accumulated views of mankind himself. I'm just accumulated like a like a vast. Hello, rate. hello, hello, hello. hello. By God, somebody snuck in there. Blew a horn in my ear. Hello. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> oh, God, will wonders never cease. I'm just... Yes, the... Uh, I'm putting this down here for the record so that people know what's uh, happening in our time. In fact, uh, you know, somebody made a great suggestion to me the other day. I was uh, I was playing Brown University of all places, uh, Brown University, and after the show, uh, after the show at Brown, though we were hanging around down in the old coffee shop there, drinking old coffee, and uh, <laughs> and we got we got talking about the decline of uh, of uh, of literacy. You know, this is at a university. And uh, this this kid uh, I was with, he was, he was a freshman or something at, the, at Brown. He says, "I'll tell you," he said, I'll, it, uh, "He says I didn't really learn how to, to learn how to read till I got into high school." He said, "They didn't really teach me." He said, that, "You know, they were they were holding up pictures of bunnies and stuff like that all through his first three years in school, and once in a while they'd hold up a picture of a horse, and the lady would say, "This is a horse," and uh, he said, that "It didn't have much to do with reading." It was all kind of a new dynamic pictorial method of learning to read. And he said, by the time I was in my late sophomore year, I only learned how to read because of total, intense, personal motivation. I became interested in pornography. He said, and overnight, <laughs> overnight, he said, I learned how to read what those words were. And he said, it changed my whole life. Well, now, uh, we got a little further in this discussion, you know, and... and uh, he says, well, I, you know, this is a fact that the literacy has been dropping off in the country because I can see it. You would, you'd be amazed at the letters. I mean, really, not only amazed, but I think a lot of people would be uh, a little saddened at the letters that you get from people who are in, uh, in colleges. And they can't, they can't even spell their own name. <laughs> it's fantastic. The letter, many letters which arrive today in the mail... Many letters that arrive today in the mail, and, and they start out, and they say, uh, Dear Shep, uh, I'm a freshman at the XYZ uh, University, so and so They have the same quality and the same curious, naive uh, crudeness, both as to spelling, construction, and many other things, that the letters that I used to receive just maybe, say, six or seven years ago from kids who started out and would say, Dear Shep, uh, I'm in the seventh grade at uh, Fig Newton uh, Junior High School. <laughs> in other words, there is a curious compression of, of, uh, of literacy. And, I, and you really... Now, they can probably pass tests. See what I'm saying? That, that a kid can pass a test, but when it comes to actually communicating to somebody who's an outside uh, observer with, the, with writ, written words, almost impossible. Fascinating. Yet you find on the other end of the scale, you find a few people who write uh, like uh, you would never expected anybody to write in the same area years ago. So it's hard to tell. But I can say this, there is a fantastic depression of, of literacy. It's a just amazing. I, I got a, uh, I got a letter the other day from a, you know, kid. He's, he's, he's a, he says he was writing from his school paper. He's the editor of the school university newspaper. And he's the editor. And, and, uh, he was, he was majoring in journalism. Here he is. He's the editor. You have never seen a, a more crudely written, badly spelled 
ineptly conceived letter. And I says, I passed it around the office. I said, you can even believe this. Now it's the way it goes, you know. I'm making no value judgments here, except to say that it is quite obvious to many people that literacy is slowly declining in the West, along with morality and a lot of other things. You know, it's a, it's a fascinating change has come about. And uh, this kid came up, you know, we're talking, sitting there drinking his coffee, in the in the coffee shop thing, he says uh, he says hey chef he says you know has it occurred to you that that uh, that some of your shows uh, that that have been taped by kids that is the literature <laughs> that is and that could very well be you know in our time that 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 the literature is really the spoken word it no longer has the symbolic word and the decline of writing is uh, maybe part and parcel with the rise of media. In other words, as television and radio and all these other media records and so on rise to greater and greater, greater and greater heights, that the that the printed page has become less and less of a media medium, excuse me, uh, and and until finally he says, can you imagine twenty thousand years from now? He says uh, we may have uh, there be a great discovery by a group of scientists, and they'll call it the Dead Sea tapes. <laughs> you know, because uh, yeah, uh, that's the only kind of thing they'll be able to understand. By then, writing will have disappeared almost completely, and it, writing will be understood only by computers. You know, computers still deal in abstract uh, language uh, skills. In other words, a computer has a whole bunch of symbols printed on the bottom of your test uh, or and, and the bottom of your checks and, and anything to do with people. It's all put in symbols, little figures and little squares and circles. You've seen those things. Well, that's the same as writing. In other words, writing is a substitute for speech. And uh, in, in, the, in the end, it, it may become ultimately speech itself. Of course, it is for a computer. Uh, there are a few computers that talk. So I, can you imagine the idea of the Dead Sea tapes? And they can't figure out how to play them, because by that time, tape recorders and everything else will have advanced so tremendously that the early tape recorders, which we're living with today, they will be early, uh, you know, 20,000 years from now. They will be ancient instruments. They will be like stone axes. Uh, you know, not many people can make a good stone axe today. But a guy, say, 25,000 years ago, could turn out a fairly effective stone axe. You know, he had to. But uh, by the year, uh, let's say by the year 21748, uh, 20,000 years or more from now, the, 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 the tape recorders that we have, that we're using, and the equipment that we're using, will actually be very primitive equipment. In fact, so much so that it will probably be, that equipment will probably be almost opaque to the people of that time. They, we can't figure out how to work it. Do you know, that, that brings up an interesting point. I don't know how I got on this subject, but do you know that, uh, that in, uh, in museums, uh, particularly there's a museum out in Chicago called the Museum of Science and Industry, where they have gathered uh, all kinds of things that are like machines and stuff. You know, of course, you, you take a museum of art uh, even say the the Metropolitan Museum. This is all self-explanatory. You, you, here's a big tapestry. Well, you, you you know that it's an art form that is no longer viable. Nobody works much in tapestry, and it's very religious in content and symbolic and all. But you recognize the fact that it is a work of art. You know this is a this is a work of art. But in museums of science and industry, uh, they have machines. As a matter of fact, that that uh, that have been preserved that go back to the time of the early Industrial Revolution and even before, they have no idea what they were used for. Have you ever seen that, Al? I mean, a machine that, that is in the museum, and they say, we do not know what in the heck it was used for. There it is. It's got wheels and little things all over it, and ratchets, and, and uh, it's got cogs, and it's got buttons and stuff that you can, and it's all made out of brass and totally, totally uh, uh, bearinged up and oiled, and, and the thing does something, but nobody knows what it does. Well, to the guy of the period, of course, obviously, he knew what it was. He was sitting there using the thing for about nine years, and there must have been thousands of others like it. You know, they're working these things away, turning out uh, snuff boxes or whatever it was. And uh, and slowly the machine drifted up to the attic, and finally it drifted down to the cellar when guys stopped chewing snuff or eating a gum root or whatever this thing dealt with. 
and and years went by and all that was left of it was the machine and no record of what it was used for and so now it sits in a glass case and, and, and it has occurred to me, when I, uh, this is one of the reasons why I dig m museums, because, you know, a lot of people never go to museums. They, to the, this, this bothers them, uh, because uh, Americans don't want to be reminded that there will be 20,000 years pass, ultimately, and none of us will be around. That, that bothers people, you know, the, the now people. You remember the now people? Remember when there were all those now people? I wonder where the now people are. I guess they're the then people now. They've changed. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you know, the, the now people were really great. Do you remember the beautiful people? That's disappeared. You'll find an occasional reference to the beautiful people in some, you know, magazines like uh, uh, Cosmo, once in a while, refer to the beautiful, meaning their readers, of course. Uh, but the, the beautiful people were a really great concept. That's, that's disappeared. Uh, do you remember the flower people? They're gone. Uh, it's terrible to be an outdated people. You know, so you walk around saying, well, I'm a now person. People say, now person? What do you mean now person? Well, you know, now I'm a now person. And, uh, and nobody knows what a now person is anymore. And you're still one. You remember the swingers? You remember that crowd, the swingers? That was that was Sammy Davis Jr. and all that gang, wasn't it? The swingers? <laughs> they, they're, they're, they're not long since disappeared into the limbo of, uh, of passing phases. But the... Uh, Nobody, nobody can remember what they what they really meant, you know. And I think machines are like that. Can you imagine one day a guy in a in a laboratory, some kind of an archaeological laboratory, trying to figure out what one of our things is that seems perfectly obvious to? For example, there is a there is a there is an unbelievably uh, kooky looking hair dryer which you see advertised on TV. It looks like a plastic uh, blow-up helmet of some kind. It's a crazy-looking helmet. Have you seen that thing? And uh, <laughs> imagine these guys trying to figure out what in the hell this thing is. Uh, 20,000 years from now, they're trying to figure out what this, this, this strange thing, they find one someplace. And uh, there's no record left of it because so much of this stuff, uh, uh, nobody writes about it. They just uh, come on TV and they talk about it and then it disappears. And I, I'm... You know, I'm convinced that a lot of the stuff that we uh, that we recognize, just absolutely without any question today, will be completely opaque to those who will be looking at it, say, 15,000 years from now. And maybe not even that long. Maybe just a thousand years, which is not long historically, you know. Now, you know, getting back to, the, to, uh, to this whole business of, uh, of uh, education, and and uh, the disappearing words and the disappearing literacy. Ultimately, I think almost all of our our personal um, statistics will all be on tape, uh, even in, recorded in our own voice. I think they are going to use the voice in lieu of uh, the old uh, thumbprint system. They'll take an analysis of. I know they do that now, but I'm saying they will do it. Totally, then. I'm not discussing what they do experimentally and occasionally now. I'm saying that everybody, instead of having his thumbprint recorded, will have his voice recorded. Uh, they will no longer an analyze uh, handwriting because people won't know how to write. <laughs> they will they will analyze your voice and say, yes, uh, you notice the way he raises uh, his, uh, he, he, uh, he, he uh, states his Ds. He has a, a hard glottal D. This shows a very aggressive personality. And uh, in other words, there will be voice analysis experts, quote, uh, will arise. Analyze your voice. Uh, and and they, they will be a big deal because people will have forgotten how to write. Uh, precipitously in our time, almost, almost people I know today don't write letters anymore back and forth. They pick up the phone. They call their aunt in, uh, you know, Clinton, Iowa. Uh, if they, uh, they don't even send the... Uh, Christmas cards anymore. Do you know that you can that you can get a service now where you just supply all the names and personalize quote Christmas cards will be sent to everybody on the list. So <laughs> ultimately, writing will be a lost art. I bet a lot of people have not actually grasped a pen in their hand to write longhand something in a long time. That the only thing they write are their name at the bottom of a check. 
they may sign a uh, a credit card uh, uh, chit that comes, you know, and the waiter brings it. And even then, he has trouble. He figures, How do I make a J? He goes, <laughs> you know, he has trouble writing his own name. And 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 I think by the year two thousand, this will be well advanced. Now, do you want to hear what it was like in another period? I'm going to give you something very interesting. I have here a copy of a fifth grade reader of the year 1879. Did you hear what I said? That's almost a hundred years. Uh, and do you want to know what kind of literacy was, was going around at that time? You know, we tend to believe that everything has been improved. Everybody is smarter now. Well, listen to this now. I'm just at random. I'm going to just, just at random open the fifth grade reader. Remember this. Okay. All right, here. This is called McGuffey's, a very famous reader, McGuffey's Fifth Eclectic Reader for the fifth grade. And here it is, right here. Reprinted in its entirety. This is not the original one. But can you imagine this appearing in a fifth grade reader now? And these kids had to learn it, you know. Listen to this. This is called the Bobolink. Now, you've heard of this bird. It's a bird, the Bobolink. And it's a little piece about the Bobolink. The happiest bird of our spring, however, and one that rivals the European lark in my estimation, is the Bobolinkin or Bobolink, as he's commonly called. He arrives at that choice portion of our year which in this latitude answers to the description of the month of May, so often given by the poets. With us, it begins about the middle of May and lasts until nearly the middle of June. Earlier than this, winter is apt to return on its traces and to blight the opening beauties of the year, and later than this begin the parching and panting and dissolving heats of summer. But in this genial interval, nature is in all her freshness and fragrance. Quote, the rains are over and gone, the flowers appear upon the earth, the time of the singing of birds has come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in the land. The trees are now in their fullest foliage and brightest verdure. I'll bet a lot of you don't even know what the word verdure means. <laughs> and that's a really good word. That's verdant, green uh, uh, leaves, leaves. Uh, the woods are gay with the clustered flowers of the laurel. The air is perfumed with the sweet briar and the wild rose. The meadows are enameled with clover blossoms, while the young apple, peach, and plum begins to swell and the cherry to glow among the green leaves. This is the chosen season of revelry of the bobolink. He comes amid the pomp and fragrance of the season. His life seems all sensibility and enjoyment, all song and all sunshine. He is to be found in the soft bosoms of the freshest and sweetest meadows, and is most in song when the clover is in blossom. He perches on the topmost twig of a tree and on some long, flaunting weed, and as he rises and sinks with the breeze, pours forth a succession of rich, tinkling notes, crowding one upon the other like the outpouring melody of the skylark and possessing the same rapturous character. Sometimes he pitches from the summit of a tree, begins his song as soon as he gets upon the wing and flutters tremulously down to the earth as if overcome with ecstasy at his own music. Sometimes he is in pursuit of his mate, always in full song, as if he would win her by her melody, and always with the same appearance of intoxication and total delight. Of all the birds of our groves and meadows, the bobolink was the envy of my boyhood. He crossed my path in the sweetest weather and the sweetest season of the year when all nature called to the fields and the rural feeling bobbed and throbbed in every bosom. But when I, luckless urchin, was doomed to be mewed up during the livelong day in a schoolroom, he perched on his reed and sang. It seemed as if this little varlet mocked at me as he flew by in full song and sought to taunt me with his happier lot. Oh, how I envied him. No lessons, no task, no school. Nothing but holiday, frolic, green fields, and fine weather. Had I been more then at that time versed in poetry, I might have addressed him in the words of Logan to the cuckoo, quote, Sweet bird, thy bower is ever green, thy sky is ever clear. Thou hast no sorrow in thy song, 
no winter in thy year. Oh, could I fly, I'd fly with thee. We'd make with joyful wing our annual visit over the globe, companions eternally of the spring. Now, isn't that beautiful? And this is in a fifth grade reader. <laughs> Boy, that teaches you something. Now, you're not going to say that's out of date. No way. That's a beautiful piece about a bird and, and, and a kid. At, so, you know, we have the idea that, that people in the, in, in the early days read things like, there goes Jimmy. He is going to see how the water is drawn from the well. No way. Now, that is from an actual fifth grade reader. I'll bet a lot of people who are college graduates would have trouble understanding most of those words, which are n none of them are outdated. They're real words and used by uh, literate people. Uh, do you want to hear some more of this? <laughs> I mean, there's fantastic stuff in this. Uh, listen to this now. This is called The Machinist's Return. On our way from Springfield to Boston, a stout, black-whiskered man sat immediately in front of me in the drawing-room car, whose maneuvers were a source of constant amusement. He would get up every five minutes, hurry away up the narrow passage leading to the door of the car, and then commence laughing in the most violent manner, continuing that healthful exercise until he observed that someone was watching him. Then he would quietly return to his seat. As we neared Boston, these demonstrations increased in frequency and violence, but the stranger kept his seat now and chuckled to himself. He shifted the position of his two portmanteaus or placed them on the seat as if he were getting ready to leave. As we were at least 25 miles from Boston, such early preparations seemed extremely ridiculous. He became so excited at last that he couldn't keep his secret. Someone must be made a confidant, and as I happened to be the nearest to him, he selected me. Okay, uh, I've just told you that now. Now, the, the thing that, that, that I find interesting in this, you know, is constantly there are pieces appearing in the book review section of the Times wondering why the great novelists have not appeared in our generation. Well, I think it's because we come from an, from a, from an almost illiterate century. <laughs> in other words, people of that time, by the, th th these were fifth grade kids reading this. No wonder they grew up to be Henry James. No wonder they grew up to become uh, uh, Melville. No wonder they grew up to you know, become Edith Wharton and Willa Cather. And we grow up to become uh, Philip Roth. <laughs> you know, it's a fascinating difference. And, and you notice that they write about the world. Uh, no, at no point do you, do you find a guy in, in this thing writing about his sensibilities and how this chick didn't dig him. Uh... There's more stuff, uh, fantastic stuff in this. Uh, this is a fifth grade reader, and and it's authentic. It was reprinted uh, directly. Uh, listen to this one. This is called The Singing Lesson, and it's a poem. A nightingale made a mistake. She sang a few notes out of tune. Her heart was ready to break, and she hid away from the moon. She wrung her claws, poor thing, but was far too proud to weep. She tucked her head under her wing and pretended to be asleep. A lark, arm in arm with a thrush, came sauntering up to the place. The nightingale felt herself blush, though feathers hid her face. She knew they had heard her song. She felt them snicker and sneer. She thought that life was too long and wished she could skip a year. O oh, nightingale, cooed a dove, Oh, nightingale, what's the use? You bird of beauty and love, why behave like a goose? Don't sulk away from our sight like a common, contemptible fowl. You bird of joy and delight, why behave like an owl? It is no crime to sing off notes. It is no crime to not have an ear for the beauty of music. In other words, it's a story about a nightingale who couldn't sing. <laughs> Now that that is imagination, you know, and 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 if you've ever read any of the kind of stuff that that uh, that 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 passes for children literature today, this call really great stuff. It is about as it's about as earthbound as a Led Zeppelin. 
It's all all illustration and hardly any content. And uh, you know, it, and I'm not I'm not uh, sitting here. Uh, uh, you know, I, <laughs> no way. Uh, there's no. Uh, this is not nostalgia, anything like that. It's just a comment that that once in a while you're hit by by what's happening in your time. And that kid up in Brown, when he says eventually they're going to th have a thing called the Dead Sea Tapes. I think he was right. Uh, this is McGuffey's fifth. Re if you're curious about getting a copy of this, this has been reprinted in the Signet Classic uh, uh, series. McGuffey's fifth eclectic reader, uh, and it's a it's a great uh, and it even tells on the front how to pronounce it. It says McGuffey's, and you know, underneath it says proper adjective fifth, and then it says fifth adjective eclectic, and then it says adjective. I wonder how many of you don't even know what the word eclectic means. <laughs> Reader, and then it says Reader, noun, 1879 edition. Listen to this line, and just at random. To endure slander and abuse with meekness requires no ordinary degree of self-command. Night coming on, both armies retired from the field of battle. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Not bad. Not bad. That's big-time stuff. The fifth eclectic reader. And uh, you know, there it is. I'm sitting here, you know, sitting here enjoying the reader. I hate to admit it. <laughs> Make way for liberty, he cried. Make way for liberty, and died. In arms, the Austrian phalanx stood, a living wall, a human wood, a wall where every conscious stone seemed to its kindred thousands grown, a rampart, all assaults to bear, till time to dust their frames should wear. A wood like that enchanted grove in which, with fiends, Rinaldo strove, where every silent tree possessed a spirit prisoned in its breast, which the first stroke of coming strife would startle into hideous life. So dense, so still, the Austrians stood, a living wall, a human wood. Impregnable their front appears, all horrent with projected spears, whose polished points before them shine from flank to flank, one brilliant line, bright as the breaker's splendors run along the billows to the sun. The Austrians stood silent like a human would. <laughs> Man, can you imagine a little fifth grade kid working that uh, stuff out, growing up to be Henry James? Or Edith Wharton, or Herman Melville. This is the kind of stuff they, you know, they they, they grew up on. Oh man, and I, it, it was a different world, totally alien to our century. And now today, the fifth grade kid sits up there and watches. Uh, this is a sea. Watch the sea dance. And the sea comes out and says, "Cookie, give me cookie, cookie monster." <laughs> flieth into the wind the quiet tears of man's infirmity as he flutters ever flutters to the dark and circling rays of the eternal sun of the excoriated time <laughs> by recording from new york you've been listening to the world of gene shepherd join us again tomorrow night at 6:30 for our next shepherd program